Okay, welcome to the second part of the lecture on short-term memory and now we will discuss the chunking hypothesis. Okay, so again a little demonstration. So um, a sheet of paper and a pen is, is useful if you have one. Um, please uh, prepare yourself. So I will now show you a, a long list of letters all on the screen and try to remember as many of them in order from left to right as possible. So it will stay on the screen and then it will ask you after some time to to write down what you can. Okay. Okay, please write down as many letters as you can remember from left to right in the order. Okay, so if you want to go back, so, oops, sorry, don't know why that. These were the letters if you want to double check and just count how many letters uh, you had correct. But, um, it's only about roughly required. Okay, another demonstration. Same task as before. You will see letters from left to right. Try to remember as many as possible. Okay, write them down. Oh, the question is now, did you remember more or less or the same amount of letters than in the first demonstration? Very likely you remembered more, considerably more. Although in both exercises, in both demonstrations, it were the same letters. But in the first one they were scrambled and now they've form, formed words. So this time you were able to chunk the letters into words. Okay, one last demonstration. Again, same task from left to right. Yes, you probably don't need that much time to look at it and you don't need to really write it down because you can tell it already. So again, very likely to be more. And this time you could not only chunk letters into words, but even then the words into a well-known sentence, which probably most of you know. So this idea of chunking was first proposed by Miller in 1956. And this paper actually is also one of the first key papers which helped to introduce cognitive psychology as a discipline, which is part of the cognitive revolution. And this paper he entitled The Magical Number 7, Plus or Minus 2, Some Limits on Our Capacity for Processing Information. And it's probably one of the most cited papers in psychology. A couple of years ago when I checked it was cited over 18,000 times. And with citation we mean improper scientific citations. And um, his key observation is that the capacity of the short-term memory does not depend directly on the amount of information as such, but how this information can be grouped into chunks. And when we think about of amount of information, people try to think of it in a more computer analogy way. So, for instance, the number of letters. You know, on a computer, how many bytes does this information take up to be represented? And he noted that this way of description is not the best one to do, 
but instead that it's the chunks which determine that. So what exactly is chunking? And there, the definition of a chunk is, and this is a little bit bulky or hard to follow, um, it is a collection of elements which have strong associations with one another, but weak associations with elements within other chunks. And typical examples are words where the exact sequence of letters has then strong connections among each other. However, the connection between one word to the next is less strong. So the words can form chunks. These chunks are based on previous knowledge. We have to learn them. So first we have to learn letters before we can even chunk them into words. And then we have to know the words uh, to be able to chunk that. So you need to be able to map that on existing knowledge structures. And Miller's argument was that the capacity of our short-term memory is somewhere on average between five and nine chunks. He said seven plus minus two. And the chunks are independent, according to his theory, of the amount of information which is in, which is within each chunk. So no matter how long the words are, it's always like five to nine. Okay, in the ni early 1960s, Murdoch did a study to support that with a proper empirical test. And there were three conditions, and I will walk you through these three conditions. The first condition was where participants have been shown such a consonant-vowel-consonant -consonant triplet, and this is like a pseudo word, one word per trial. And because it's a non-word, people have to remember that as three letters, X, U, V. So if you would see that on the screen and you would rehearse that in your mind, you would probably say X, U, V, sorry, X, U, W, X, U, W, X, U, W, and so forth. So in a word, way, each letter constitutes a chunk in itself. So we have three letters as an amount of information and also three chunks. Okay, so the second condition, group two, where participants saw one proper three-letter word like dog, for instance. So again, we have the same information here, three letters in both cases. However, this time the three letters can be combined into one chunk. So the number of chunks differs, but the number of inf the amount of information is the same. Now the third condition was that participants saw three proper three-letter words, like dog, bar, pen. Now the information is much higher, nine letters, but the number of chunks is like in the first one. Now the question is, how? what was the outcome? How was the performance? Were these two conditions similar, because it was three letters in both instances? Or are these conditions, conditions one and three, similar, because in both cases it were three chunks? And what they found was indeed that con the performance in condition one was comparable to the performance of condition three. Although much more information in terms of letters has to be remembered, it's three chunks here and three chunks here. Because it's a non-word, every letter constitutes a chunk in itself. And the condition two had better performance than the other two. Because it was easier, because there was only one chunk to remember. So this is strong empirical support for the idea that chunking indeed takes place when we encode information in our short-term memory. Let's summarize that. So chunking is the grouping of units of information, for instance letters, into groups such as words, which can later be used as units themselves. Of course the same thing also works um, for numbers. For instance, um, when we still had landline numbers, <laughs> they were much more common and people had them in their mind, uh, you had the area code of, the, uh, of where you were living. And most people had the same area codes and you would know the area codes of the surrounding uh, towns and cities. So that when you had to 
memorize a phone number, the area code would just take up one slot, one chunk, because that has been, you would just say, oh, it's the area code of, I don't know, New York. Chunks are long-term memory structures that are learned, so we have to map that onto them. And the short-term memory capacity is limited mostly by the number of chunks and not the raw amount of information. So if you are really um, good at memorizing information and can create huge chunks in your mind, your short-term memory can get can seem quite big and quite tremendous because you can use it more or less like a pointer to your long-term memory representations. Okay, thanks a lot for listening to that section on the chunking hypothesis and then um, let's see you hopefully for the next session as well.